How do we get peace in this world? That's what we're going to find out today in Romans 5. I was listening to various commentaries and people talk about it, and someone brought up the point that Romans 5 is Martin Luther's favorite chapter in the book. I can see why. He's kind of a deep guy. This is kind of a deep book for sure. And I noticed, too, that luckily the people who created all these chapter marks made these chapters rather small, and I think because they're so dense with thought. Again, I think so far, out of all the times that I've been doing the Bible study, I think I spent the most time on Sermon on the Mount, and now Romans. Romans is just thick with thoughts. And so, uh, again, if you feel like I got it right, got it wrong, please email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com, and I would love to hear what you think about Romans. So Romans 5, this is labeled peace with God through faith. And again, most of whatever I read, unless it's coming right out of a commentary, is ESV. So he says, you know what? We've been justified by faith, and then we have peace with God. And what I said last time is there's a lot of people who feel their sins are too big. I can't come back to God. Or I just did something, and even though I thought I was saved, I no longer think I am because look at this horrible thing I did. And he says that we're going to get peace because we've been justified by faith, not works, not actions. Those are all great things. Those are all things that we should aspire to do. We should live the life that God has called us to live, but it's not what saves us. It's an indication. I know I'm doing too much of an implication, I mentioned before, like if you got married, I love you. I think you're the best in the world. And then you don't change your life and you live as if you were single. People will question whether or not that love is true. I have known people who I am pretty sure were Christian in name only. They wanted to belong to the right country club. Didn't see anything in them when they described it that would indicate that they believe that Jesus paid for their sins. Bob Guzik, when he goes through in his commentary on this, talks a great deal about, is it enough to just believe that Jesus is God? Well, the devil thinks Jesus is God. Is it enough to just believe that Jesus died and came back from the dead? I'm pretty sure the demons also believe that is true too. But what it is that we have confidence is, is that we have faith that our sins were justified by Jesus in his death resurrection. He has paid the price, propitiation, atonement. He has paid for our sins. That's what the faith that we have. And we should have peace because we believe that he has died for our sins. And that, that's where this chapter, and you can tell that's probably why Martin Luther thought it was the best chapter, but it says that we've attained faith through him into grace. And we rejoice in the hope of God. We rejoice in our sufferings. Paul would know. I mean, that man suffered a lot in the name of God, but he rejoiced in it. Paul is a human guy, and you have to wonder, did at every moment, did he rejoice in his suffering? But overall, he did. You know, sometimes you get into a situation where you're, oh, and you're not rejoicing, and you don't have the peace, but then suddenly you think, you know what? God is standing by me. or if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to go through this horrible thing, I know how this ends. And so he says that we know that that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So there's a point. There's a point in all of this. And you see people crumble, you know, when something bad happens and they shatter. They shatter as a human being. They don't get endurance. They don't get character. Gosh, I was listening to someone and they were talking about, I don't know, work in general and how, oh, you know, work got hard, so I just quit. And I'm not saying that work is the suffering that Paul served, but you see that people are not building character. They're not having endurance. They're just like, eh. I'm just going to give up and eat macaroni and cheese and watch television and just quit my job. God wants us to be strong. He wants us to grow, not just in faith, but in our lives. We are going to go through tough times. I can tell you in my own life, I have learned tough times 
before I was a Christian, while I was a Christian, and they have made me strong. It all builds together into my character. So when things get tough within my faith, I have learned lessons on the training wheels of life. And I think that's what he's saying here, that we need to get that endurance and character and hope that God wants us to have because we know he loves us and he gave us the Holy Spirit. And he says, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the holy. He didn't die for the self-righteous. He didn't say that everyone was so good they didn't need my death to pay for their sins. And he said that most people will die for a good man, you know, for a good person. You've seen that, right, in movies where we'll stand with you to the end. Yeah. You know, we, we rally behind people we think are good. And Paul's saying in this case, you know what? He died for the ungood. He, he rallied for you. He rallied for me. He rallied for every sinner out there, which is every person died for us all. And now we're justified by his blood. We're saved from the wrath of God. And it says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled by the death of his son. And keep in mind, we learned in John, this was a plan from the very beginning. This was the idea. I, I think people get this wrong idea. And I, I think I did too, that there is the Old Testament God who makes the mountains rumble. Almost in a sense, I, I never thought of him as mean, but I thought of him as so big, like the mountains that he didn't see the individuals or, you know, nations. He saw nations moving and this is the rule and these are the things you're supposed to follow. I forgot how many, but there's like, you know, 600 do's and don'ts, you know, in the Old Testament, you should do this and not do that. And these people fell apart from me and these people stood in line with me and I exiled these people and I brought these people home. And then we think, well, you know, wrath, right? And then we think Jesus, well, Jesus was the nice one. He came and died for our sins. He said very kind things. He forgave people. He brought widows up. He healed the very sick and the dead. You get this image of the mean God versus the nice God, and it is all one God. Same God. But the idea is that there's a law. God built this manual of how we operate best and said, these are the rules that are going to lead to the best life, the life I want you to have. And I'm going to tell you things. I'm going to bring prophets before you who will share the word of God, tell you what's going to happen. You know, if you keep going down this path, you fall away from me. I mean, even David, who, who God loved dearly, David fell away, fell away in his sin. And he's like, I want you to live the way I want you to live. But it's not a mean thing. Just like when a parent says, hey, son, don't put your hand on the stove. Is that mean? No. I mean, I think I even got like put in the corner because I was doing something very dangerous. Is that mean? No, it's the most loving thing a parent can do to say this is important. Pay attention. That's even to the point of, of a parent having a little bit of wrath because you did something very stupid, right? And it's not good parent versus bad parent. It is a loving parent all the way around and the same loving parent. But God reconciled us. And then he goes on to say that sin came in through the world through Adam, one man, and through the sin that he committed. I remember when I first became a Christian, my pastor wanted to teach me how to do a Bible study. So he sat down with us with just the beginning of Genesis and said, I want you to count how many sins Adam and Eve committed. And I thought, well, I just kind of thought there was just one big one with the apple, right? And my pastor kind of laughed and he goes, I want you to go look and then find some. So I don't know, I wasn't very good at this. And so I came back and I said, I think it was just the apple. I think that was the big sin. And I think we got to the first, I don't know, 10 minutes of my pastor showing me where we got up into seven different sins. And I'm like, oh, I see what you're saying here. So he really taught me how to read the Bible, but that's what he's saying, that this sin came in through Adam. We might talk about what Eve did, but Adam's responsible for all of it. And it comes down through us because we are all children of Adam, every single one of it. Death reigned, he said, from Adam to Moses, everyone. It came all the way through the line. And many died, you know, because of this one man's trespass. 
And I always got kind of mad because I always got this idea that if it was me and I was in the Garden of Eden, of course I wasn't going to eat the apple. But the point is, is that not only did Adam sin for all mankind, but we would have done the same thing. We would have sinned too. It is impossible for any one of us to to abide by every you know by what God said. It just isn't. We're, we're not better. And so, just like we got this, and so He's saying that because of all this, we have all had because of this one sin, condemnation. But we also sin for our own condemnation. So don't you know blame it all on Adam. But with this justification, it's for everything. It is from all the way back to the first sin through all the way through our last sin. And because we had this lineage through Adam, death reigned, he said. You know, death was the ruler of this earth. Free gift of righteousness, he says. Life reigns because of one man, Jesus Christ. Well, never met, or at least maybe personally, Walk to Jesus while Jesus was alive. He maybe saw him, maybe saw him walking down the street. Maybe he saw him at the crucifixion. But everything that Paul has learned about this, he has learned directly from God. Wow. So then uh, he said that just because, just as there was one trespass, one act was also leading to justification. So now all the disobedience, all the sinning has made righteous because of the one act of Jesus dying and resurrecting, defeating death. And so the law, he says, increases because the sin is also increased. We're sinning all over the place. We sin left and right. We sin a hundred times a day. And so then we could say, you know, that means grace abounds even more because grace reigns through righteousness leading to eternal life. Again, short chapter, but very, very deep. And so I'm going to meditate on is this fact that There is nothing we could do about it. This is justified through faith that all the sins that Adam committed, Eve committed, Moses committed, I committed, everybody, everybody, everybody committed, adds up. But yet one act saves all the sins and reconciles us to God, which is the plan that God had along the whole time. God wanted us saved. God the Father wanted us saved. Jesus wants us saved, and the Holy Spirit wants us saved. There's no mean God. There's no happy God. There's just God. And what I'm going to pray about is that I always have confidence, no matter what I do in my life or what I incur, that I always can come back to Jesus and understand his one act saves me through everything. And what I'm going to tell others is that same truth, that their sins, small, large, medium, public, private, it's all justified through one person's action. And that's Jesus leaving heaven, coming here, dying for our sins, and resurrecting from his death on the cross. We are all justified because of that one thing. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. I hope that you're enjoying this and hopefully you're reading along. I think that this is beneficial when you do read along. One thing I noticed, you know, that's been helpful to me is that I have to explain it to you. So I think a lot of times it's very easy for us to gloss over a term, you know, that you read something that's very difficult, like Romans 5, and you just, okay, okay, I get it. We're all justified from our sins and transgressions. But instead, reading this word for word and trying to dig it out as if you had to explain it to another human being. So I you know, challenge you, I guess, to think about doing that. Read each of these chapters and and think of how you would try to explain what you just read to somebody else. It will force you into a new level of understanding. All right. Thank you so much. Again, you can email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. You can find me on Twitter and I do have YouTube. My YouTube channel is a little bit of a mess, but all these podcasts are up on YouTube. And so you can look for Small Steps with God. You'll find all the Small Steps with God podcasts right there on YouTube if you want to watch them on a web browser instead of listening to them on a podcast. Thank you so much for listening.